before you. Happy Sabbath. You know, there's so much going on at this church. I hope you're enjoying the family Sabbath tradition. This is our, our second time doing this. Um, so for many of you, maybe your first time if you weren't here for the first Sabbath of the new year. Uh, today also we had a breakfast at 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, so I hope that those of you who were here for that enjoyed that. And that's uh, going to be an ongoing thing. So we encourage you to come at that uh, for that at, at 9 a.m. There's... Uh, Koinonia on Wednesday nights, along with Koinonia Kids at 7 o'clock. There's Praxis on Friday nights, so if you enjoy uh, the music that we have here, our praise band, uh, we play every Friday night, and a service that's, you know, a, a little, a, a, this is a hybrid of what we do on Friday night and what we traditionally do. So if you enjoy this, I invite you to come out on Friday nights. Everyone is welcome. And we also have a uh, a marathon clinic. We have some people who run every Sunday morning. Any, anyone here? I, I was just talking with some people who, uh, who are part of that running group on Sunday mornings. Now, I was thinking about all of you runners last Sunday because uh, one of our young adult leaders, Ivy, who is the principal of the East Valley Adventist School, uh, she put together a jogathon fundraiser and to help, you know, support uh, the school. So last Sunday, Luke and I ran. We have a picture of that. So <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, but okay, there we, there we go. <laughs> uh, now, full disclosure, Luke runs on a regular basis, and he just compl recently completed a full marathon. So I thought he was going to be running circles around me, and so I'm very happy to say that I finished within one lap of Luke, and I consider that a win in my book. Uh, we ran about six miles in an hour, which uh, that's, that, that's fair, I think. Um, you know, about halfway through, my, my feet started to blister up, so you'll notice uh, I ran the, the second half, so I ran about three miles barefoot. Fortunately, it was on grass, so it, it, was, all, it was all fine. But if you'd like to uh, support uh, or congratulate Luke and I on our valiant running, um, or if you'd just like to support uh, you know, Adventist education, I encourage you to get a hold of Luke or myself, uh, make out a check to East Valley Adventist School, and uh, make sure that all of our kids can receive a Christian education. Now, I don't bring this up just for the sake of uh, a plug or an advertisement. <clears throat> As I was reflecting on this week's gospel reading, uh, my running experience came to my mind because I noticed that I had a little bit different strategy than Luke did. Uh, you know, he set off at what I thought was going to be a much faster pace, but he had this steady jog that he didn't speed up, he didn't slow down. So I immediately kind of took off running. So I, I passed him on the first lap, and then I would get tired and slow way down and walk. And so I, Luke kept pretty much the same pace the whole time, and I kept running and walking and running and walking. And again, in the end, it kind of balanced out. Now, as far as running goes, I don't know if that's a good strategy or not. It did get a little awkward. I know Nick and I passed each other several times because I would run past him, and then when I stopped, he would pass me and, we'd, you know, just keep going back and forth like that. But it reminded me of... Uh, this gospel reading, because it's all about stopping and going, stopping and going. That's what we see in today's gospel reading. That's why I've entitled this message, uh, The Rhythm of the Spiritual Life. What do I mean by that? Well, in this passage uh, that we heard Peter read this morning, we see three moments. The first is that Jesus is busy uh, healing and serving all the people in the town. From Sabbath sundown late into the night, the whole town had gathered around and he was healing anyone who was sick. But then early in the morning, before the sun came up, Jesus gets up and finds a quiet place to pray. And when they finally find Jesus on Sunday morning, what's the first thing he says to them? But now it's time to go on to the next town and to do this again to bring the good news to them as well. So that's the rhythm of the spiritual life that I'm talking about. Service leads to prayer, and prayer leads to service. Just like on my Sunday morning jog, you run, and then you stop, and you run, 
and then you stop. So let's begin with this service dimension that we see in the gospel. At the beginning of the gospel reading, we see Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, uh, who was in bed with a fever. But just before this, and this was the section of Mark's gospel that Luke preached on last week, uh, Jesus had been in the synagogue and was confronted with a man uh, possessed by an unclean spirit. So already this morning, Jesus had been dealing with a uh, demoniac. He goes home for a uh, Sabbath lunch and finds that there's even more work to do. Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and so Jesus heals her as well. Now, remember, Jesus' ministry has just started. This is at the very, very beginning of his ministry. So far, he only has four disciples, two pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. But after the exorcism in the morning and the healing in the afternoon, word about Jesus is beginning to spread already. And so that night, after the Sabbath was over, people began flocking to Peter's home to see Jesus and to be healed. And here's lesson number one for us. You know, we, has, we as Christians have a responsibility to serve those around us. We have a responsibility to be engaged in what we call works of mercy. We saw it in, that in today's uh, second reading, uh, Paul says to the Corinthians, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust that was given to me. We as Christians have a responsibility to be involved in service to others, meeting their needs, both physical and spiritual, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, counseling the doubtful, bearing patiently with those who wrong us, forgiving those who offend us, comforting the afflicted. And so because we have this responsibility, you may be asking yourself, well, where and how should I be engaged in these things? I mean, as you know, there are plenty of uh, shelters and missions and charities, places where you can volunteer your time or donate your money. But look at Jesus' example. What does he do here? But he begins at home. He begins with friends and family. He begins with the people that are already within his circle. And this is a really important insight, I think, because you know it's possible to spend your time volunteering. It's possible to give your money to charity, something like that, and still be a miserable person, right? <laughs> Those two things are not mutually exclusive. I think that's why even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, I can give all of my money to the poor, but if I don't have love, then what is it really? And I think that's what we see here in Jesus' example, is that he begins with the people around him. He doesn't begin with some heroic effort to go and try and save the world, but he begins by simply healing those who are near him. He begins by addressing the needs that are around him. And why is this so important? Because ultimately what it comes down to for us is having the eye for these opportunities. We have to be in the habit of seeing the needs around us. So of course it's easy to go out and find specific places where we know people have need and we say, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to help these people. But maybe we're oblivious to the people right in our proximity who need us. So I know this happens to me all the time and maybe to you as well, but I'll have a conversation with someone and they'll open up about some need that they have, some pain that they're going through. And then it won't be until hours after the fact that it'll su suddenly dawn on me, wh why, didn't I, why didn't I do anything? Why, why didn't I offer to help in some way? Why, why didn't, there, there were so many things I could have done in that moment that didn't even occur to me. And it only strikes you later. It's this kind of delayed reaction. Now what's going on there but that I'm not in the habit of it. I don't have an eye for it. 
so that when an opportunity presents itself, I don't immediately recognize it. But see, that's what we're after here, is to be in this mode, to be in this mindset, so that when the opportunity presents itself, wherever you may be, we are ready to be engaged. The gospel is inviting us to be in the habit of serving people around us. And if we do that, as Jesus did, then the opportunities will multiply themselves. So if we ever want to be spiritual giants, we have to be faithful in the little things. As Jesus said, you have been faithful with a few things, so I will put you in charge of many things. Now what happens next? Even after going late into the night, being around people, healing them, helping them, it says very early in the morning, even before the sun came up, Jesus left the house and went to find a quiet place to pray. Now this seems like such a small and simple thing, but this little scene speaks so powerfully to me because what this moment teaches us more than anything is our desperate need of prayer. Jesus doesn't get up while it's still dark because it's convenient. He doesn't do it because he feels well rested and he's just overflowing with energy. He does it because he needs energy. Sharing in our humanity, he, like us, became entirely dependent on his Father. And so by going out of his way to make time for prayer like this, he's showing us how desperately we need prayer. Just as when I was running, I needed to take time to catch my breath, so spiritually our busy lives demand that we take time to rest and recharge. Now, you would think that resting and recharging would be easy to do. It seems like that's what we would naturally want. It would be uh, easy for us to want to stop and just spend time in God's presence to put away your work, put away your stress, put away your worries. You'd think it would be easy for us, but it isn't. So much so that God has to command it. God has to compel us to rest. God has to give us an obligation because we would be so quick to pass over it. But you see, this moment of rest has to be more than just once a week. This has to be our daily routine to find spiritual refreshment. It has to be a commitment for us. Because when I see Jesus getting up at dawn on a Sunday morning, what that tells me is that this is a commitment. This is a habit. Because he's not doing it out of convenience. He's not doing it because the opportunity presented itself. He took time for prayer because he was committed to it. And he wouldn't let anything get in his way. Not a late night of partying, not a late night of work. Not sleep, not food, not anything. He was committed to this. And that's the only way to make sense of what he's doing. And that's how it has to be for us. You see, if we only pray when we feel like it, if we're only spiritually engaged when it's convenient, then we aren't really spiritually engaged at all. Because the time when we need prayer the most is when we want it the least, right? Time when we need prayer the most is when we want it the least. That's why it has to be a habit. It has to be a commitment. Again, think of the parallel of our physical strengths, our physical efforts. If I lift weights that never feel heavy to me, if my muscles never get sore, then am I getting any stronger? If I go out and run and my heart rate never goes up, I never, my breathing never gets heavy, is my conditioning getting any better by doing that? You see, we grow precisely by pushing ourselves, precisely by having those opportunities where we have to push through even when we don't feel like it, but because we need it. 
But you see, the more we skip it, the less we feel our need for it, right? The more time we make excuses, the more time we spend away from it, uh, the less important it seems. And so it becomes easier and easier to drift away from a spiritual life. But I'll tell you that just because you don't feel like you need prayer doesn't mean you don't. What it means is, God forbid, a crisis happens in your life and you're caught flat-footed, too spiritually weak, too spiritually immature to handle what may come. So we have to always be ready, and as in the words of the prophet Isaiah, even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So Jesus is out by himself praying, apparently long enough for the rest of the house to wake up and realize that Jesus isn't there. So they begin looking for him. And Peter sets off and finds him, and he says to Jesus, everyone has been looking for you. And what does Jesus say in reply? We must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too, since that is why I came. And according to Mark's reporting, so they did. He went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues, and casting out demons. Jesus' time in prayer leads him again to service because the prayer that Jesus prays throughout the Gospels, it always echoes the same sentiment, whether it be the Lord's Prayer or the prayer that we see him offering in the Garden of Gethsemane. The prayer of Jesus is always this one thing, Thy will be done. You see, because our prayer life, if it's going to be this refreshment, if it's going to be the strength that we need, if it's going to compel us and move us out into service, it has to be that prayer, thy will be done. Not just seeking our own wants and wishes, but time in prayer is meant to uh, submit ourselves to God's will, to attune ourselves to his plan for our lives. That's how we are refreshed and prepared to spend another day in service. So here we see this cycle continuing. Jesus' service drives him to prayer, and his prayer leads him to service. And so it must be for us. That's the rhythm of the spiritual life. We go and give, but we must also come and receive. Because if we don't take time to receive, God's grace, what grace will we have to share? And if we don't take time to share God's grace, what need will we have to receive it? Our prayer must lead us to service, and our service must lead us to prayer. So for you, I don't know which of these may be missing, maybe both, but I urge you to take that next step in your spiritual life. Commit yourself to a regular routine of prayer. Make a commitment, even if it's something small to begin with. But take time to be in God's presence. Take time to be quiet. Take time to hear what God is impressing on you to do. And when you hear that calling, when you know what God is putting on your heart to do, then act, and act quickly. The Bible says, whatever you find to do, do it with all your strength. And whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Not as if you were working for any of us, but working for the Lord. And when you're working, building these habits of kindness and service, keep coming back to the Lord for strength, for guidance, and for courage to carry on.